Good morning. Welcome again to Morning Devotions, and thank you again so much for our time together. I'm Pastor Samuel, the pastor of the Cathedral of Praise. Now, brothers and sisters, it's Monday morning. We're beginning a new week. We are at week 30. Can you believe it? We are at week 30. This is the 30th week of the year. What has happened to this year? And I have to be honest with you. I'm taking my life, my family, and we're settling in for the rest of the year. We're starting to work with the church and the staff to just settle in for the rest of the year. Now, we'll be announcing what that means as we go, but, you know, 10% capacity, 50% capacity, whatever they allow us, we'll continue to have services. But I'm going to spend a lot of time online teaching you. I'm going to start tonight. Every night I'm going to sit down with you live and teach you from the book of Romans, the greatest theological dissertation on salvation in the Bible, the greatest theology book, Romans and Galatians together, Paul's greatest theological work. And I'm just going to begin to walk you through the book of Romans every night, and it will probably take us to the end of the year. We'll go Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, we'll bring the service to you live. Uh, Saturday night will be our special event. Sister Bev's going to put together special events with guests and things, and we'll have a special event every Saturday night and then Sunday the services. And we're just going to settle in for the rest of the year. We're going to settle in writing on the screen like this. We've got some new technology that will allow me to sit here and push buttons with my left hand and write with one hand and look, look at a camera with the other hand, with my face, not my other hand. I don't have three hands. But we're going to have some fun together. But we're going to settle in. And I'll be talking to you as we go through this week about settling in as a family. Right now, Lola has a wonderful recitation for us of Psalms 91. Siyang naghahangad ng pagpapkop ng kataas-taasan at nananatili sa kalinga niya ang makapangyarihan, makapagsasabi sa aking Panginoon, muog katahanan. Ikaw ang aking Diyos. Ang Diyos na tangi kong pinagtiwalaan. Ika'y ililigtas niya sa mga pangalib, sa anumang bitag. At kahit na anumang mabigat na salot, di ka magdaranas. Luluko ba niya sa lilim ng kanyang malabay na pakpak? Sa kalinga niya ay matitiyak mong ikaw ay Ligtas, iingatan niya at ipagsasanggalang sapagkat sa'y tapat. Pagsapit ng gabi, di ka matatakot. Maging sa anumang gagawing bigla ang paglusog, pagsapit ang araw. Ni sa ano pa mang bagay na darating pagsapit ng dilim, di ka matatakot sa kasamaan mang araw kung dumating. Kahit na mabuwal sa iyong harapan ang isang libong tao, at sa iyong paligid ang bilang ng patay maging sampun libo, di ka matatakot pagkat natitiyak mo, hindi ka maaano. Ika'y nagmamasid. At sa panonood mo iyong mamamasdan, iyong masasamay pinarurusahan. Sapagkat siyawi ang iyong ginawang tagapagsanggalang at ang pinili mong mag-iingat sa iyong kataas-taasan, hindi mo aabuting ika'y mapahamak. At walang daratal kahit anong uring mga paghihirap sa iyong tahanan. Susuguin niya ang maraming anghel silang susubaybay kahit saan ka man maparoon siyak iingatan. Sa kanilang palad ay itasayo ka silang magtataas nang hindi masaktan ang mga paamo sa batong matalas. Kahit natapakan mo ay mga liyot, ahas na mabagsik. Di ka mga ano, sa mga serpentit liyong mababangis. Ang sabi ng Diyos, 
aking iingatan ang tapat sa akin. At ililigtas ko ang sino mong taong ako'y kikilan din. Pag sila'y tumawag, lagi akong tapat. Sila'y pakinggan na sila'y pakinggan. Aking sasam... Aking sasamahan. Aking sasamahan. At kung may ligalig, ay sasakluluhan. Aking ililigtas sa tambaw at isa'y pararangalan. Sila'y bibigyan ko't gaganting palaan ng mahabang buhay at nakasitiyak na ang tatamuhin nila ay kaligtasan. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. After having done everything there is to do, we stand. Father, sometimes there is nothing more that we can do except stand. I'd ask that you teach every father, every mother, every parent how to lead their families in this situation. Father, we, we can't think about tomorrow. And Jesus, you, you taught us that we should live for today because every day has its own problems, so don't worry about tomorrow. We're to live in the now. Father, we ask that you teach us. Teach us how to stand firm as we weather this storm. By your grace, we've built our lives upon the word. And Lord, as the storm has come, our lives have not been shaken. Our lives, our businesses, our, everything we've given our lives to build has not been destroyed. We are grateful, Father. We're grateful for the solid foundation of the word in our lives. But Father, we ask for wisdom. Wisdom in exactly how to take our families, work with the young people, work with our children, that this not be a wasted year, Father. We are to redeem the time for the days are evil, and these are evil days. Teach us how to redeem the time and how to move forward with our families in spite of everything going on around us. Father, I ask that you give each family a plan through the rest of this year, not just economically, Father, but educationally and in every way for the family to develop and grow. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's open up our hearts now and spend some time in worship.
Well, we're going to begin the book of Romans tonight in our teaching. And we're going to take a small passage every night and teach for about 30 minutes every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. You say, Pastor, why did you choose Romans? Well, I looked at Romans and I looked at the book of Revelation and I wanted to do expositorily. But I thought, you know what, right now when everything in life is being shaken, we need to be grounded. We need, we need good foundations. And the book of Romans is the best foundation builder and the best foundation strengthener I know. So we'll get into that tonight. But today we're picking up for our devotional reading in chapter 2, beginning with verse 17. Paul addresses the Jews. He said, so you call yourself a Jew and you rely on the law and boast in God. He looks at these religious leaders and he says, okay, wonderful, you're a Jew. He said, but that's what you call yourself. You, you can't think that that's what God calls you, and we'll see why here in a moment. He said, this is, this is a self-title, which probably irritated them a little bit. And he said, you rely on the law. You, you think that the law gives life. And he said, and you boast in God. And you boast that you know his will. And you boast that you approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law. So, okay, you rely on the law, you're instructed in the law, and because you rely and because you are instructed, therefore you boast in God, you know his will, and you approve what is excellent. So one, two, three. And he said, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind and a light to those in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of the children. Now, now notice how they, this is how they thought of themselves. Now notice how they thought of themselves. You are a guide to the blind. You are a light to those in darkness. You are an instructor of the foolish. You are a teacher of children. Having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. <laughs> Notice, in the law. So they rely on the law. They're instructed in the law. And they believe that in the law, in the law, the, the law is the complete embodiment of knowledge and the complete embodiment of truth. They thought everything is in the law. Now, understand what the law is. The law is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It does not say the law and the prophets. It just says the law. So they thought in the Pentateuch, in the first five books of the Bible, there is the embodiment, the full totality of knowledge and truth. Now that's how the Jews in Paul's day felt. And really, I have been shocked in my trips to Israel how many very devout Jews, when I talk to them about Ezekiel, when I talk to them about Zechariah, when I talk to them about Malachi, they know these guys, but they never study the prophets. They only study the law. See, they think those first five books are everything. He said, you then who teach others, <laughs> now we get to truth, okay? This is their thoughts of themselves. Now we get to truth. You who teach others, do you not teach yourself? Hmm. While you preach against stealing, do you steal? While you say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? Like, do, do, you, do you take the wealth out of temples? Do, do you go in there to steal the gold and things? When, when you have an opportunity to, to rob a, a demon temple, do you go in there and rob it? <laughs> now, here's the rebuke. He said, you who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. Now, we come up here to verse 17, and we write down here verse 17, and up by verse 17, we write verse 23. 
You boast in God. You boast in the law. Now notice, you boast in the law, but you dishonor God by breaking the law. All right? Now here's something even a Christian needs to get a hold of. Your lifestyle affects God. Your lifestyle affects God's name. It doesn't change God, but it affects God's name. You dishonor God. When, when Christians go to clubs and knock back their shooters and get drunk, and then, oh, praise the Lord, they dishonor God in front of people. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Wow. The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. You claim that you're a guide to the blind, a light to those in darkness, an instructor of the foolish. You, you claim all of that, but because of your lifestyle, the very people you say you should be teaching, you blaspheme God in front of. Then he goes on in verse 25, and this is a big concept that opens up in the book of, of Romans. For circumcision is indeed a value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. All right, so obedience affects ritual. Okay, as a child, you were circumcised. Wonderful. That is a sign of the covenant. Remember, circumcision in the Old Testament was a sign of the covenant, that you were in covenant with God. He said, but if you disobey, the, if you break the law, uh, the sign of the covenant is removed. So obedience affects ritual. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Okay, it works both ways. So if a guy who is a Gentile, he's never been circumcised, but he, he does what is right, he has the sign of the covenant with God. Now that would really get everybody upset. Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. So again, he is saying this thing about Jew or Gentile is not relevant. What is relevant is obedience. For no one who is a Jew who is one, one out, merely, out, merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. Okay. Now, you call yourself a Jew, verse 17, but you know what? A Jew is not one outwardly, a Jew is one inwardly. So verse 28 and 29. So a Jew, you, you don't, you know how later on Paul will teach us about we have been grafted into the, to the olive branch? The, these wild branches have been grafted in. We Gentiles were called the wild branches. We've been grafted in. Because of what happens in our hearts. A Jew is someone who is a Jew inwardly. Circumcision is of the heart, by the spirit. You have a, a sign of the covenant in your life by the spirit. Then he starts in chapter 3, verse 1. Then what advantage has a Jew? He said, okay, if it's, if it's irrelevant... Jew or Gentile because it's about the heart, not about the genetics. It's about uh, obedience. It's not about religious ritual. Then what advantage is a Jew? Or of what value is circumcision? Much in every way. He said, now, we do need to realize this. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God, the word, Okay. They were entrusted with the word. Now, they never took it to the world like they were supposed to, but they were entrusted with the word. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Now, here is, 
This is something you've got to just get a hold of. Man does not change the character of God. However you act, it's not going to change the character of God. Our faithlessness, our unfaithfulness, does not change the faithfulness of God. Now, now you need to get a hold of that because, you know, we've watched how actions reveal and change people. You know, you can, you can take a, a good woman and she gets married to a bad man and you'll watch her whole character change. Her whole character will change in that relationship and you think, I can remember when that was a good woman. Or, or you see a young man who's a good young man and he gets in a bad barcada. Or you see a man who's a really good man and he starts hanging out with bad attitude people and you, you watch them change and you realize people can change people. But Paul says you need to understand something. You cannot change the character of God. Even when we are faithless, he's faithful. He said by no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar. And as it is written, that you may justify, be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. Now, we'll get more into this later on in our study, that, that you may be justified. God is true, that he may be justified in his words and prevail when you are judged. God doesn't change. Beautiful, beautiful truth here today. All right, let's open up our hearts and spend some more time in worship. There's got to be more Going back and forth From doing right to doing wrong Cause we were torn as who we are But come on, get in line right behind me You along with everybody Making this world in what you do Living like a hero who takes the stage When we're on the edge of a seat Saying it's too late let me introduce you to amazing grace. No matter the bumps, no matter the bruises, no matter the scars, still the truth is the cross has made, the cross has made you flawless. No matter the hurt or how deep the wound, like this, wrap him up in righteousness, but that's exactly what that's he exactly did. What he did.
Our Old Testament passage today picks up in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 1. That all the people of Judah, and remember this is the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father Amaziah. He built Eloth and restored it to Judah after the king slept with his fathers. Uzziah was 16 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. This is a very long term. And we want to ask the question, why? Ah, the very next verse. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all his father Amaziah had done. All right, so godly life, long life, long rule. He set himself to seek God in the days of Zechariah. Now, this is the prophet. Remember the prophet Zechariah. He set himself to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of the Lord. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Now, notice he was instructed in respect. See, the fear of the Lord is not taqot, okay? It's respect, pagdagon, okay? It was, he was instructed in the respect of God. Do you know how little respect, and now, now please, I feel like I'm old when I say this, but, you know, in 1990, people showed respect for one another. In 1980, people really showed respect for each other. You could always tell a balakbayan because the young people had no respect, and you could always go, yeah, they just came from America, didn't they? They have no respect. And very quickly, their grandparents began to instruct them <laughs> in respect. I, I watch a lot of people today. They have no respect for themselves. They have no respect for God. They have no respect for the men of God. They have no respect for people. I mean, young people have no respect for their parents. Respect is something that you have to be instructed in, okay? And respect for God is something you have to be instructed in. Now, as long as he sought the Lord, which is what he was doing, God made him prosper. All right, so prosperity is the result of a God seeker. Prosperity is the result of a God seeker, not a riches seeker. Those who desire to get rich fall into all kinds of trouble. We just taught you that a few weeks ago. Prosperity is the result of a God-seeker. He went out and made war against the Philistines and broke through the wall of Gath and the wall of Jabna and the wall of Ashdod. And he built cities in the territory of Ashdod and everywhere among the Philistines. God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabians who lived in Gerbaal and against the Meonites. The Ammonites paid tribute to Uzziah and his fame spread even to the border of Israel. For he became very strong. Now, why did his fame spread? Why did he become very strong? Verse 7, God helped him. <laughs> Remember the passage, God stooping down or God's gentle help makes us great? Well, here is a perfect illustration of that. Now, if I had time and you weren't here listening, I would have my little iPad over here and I'd look up that verse real quick and I'd put it in right here. Okay, I put in that verse right here. God's gentleness or God's stooping down makes us great. Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate and the valley gate and the angle and fortified them. And he built towers. Now, towers are... That's a good position to fight from, all right? And he built towers in the wilderness and cut out many cisterns. Now, cisterns are for water. Towers are for defense. For he had large herds, both in Shephelah and in the plain. And he had farmers and vine dressers in the hills and in fertile, va fertile, fertile lands, for he loved the soil. All right, so here is a character trait of Uzziah. So Uzziah loved the soil, okay? He's a king who loved agriculture. Now, some kings didn't, but he did. 
Moreover, Uzziah had an army of soldiers fit for war in divisions according to the numbers in the muster made by Jael, the secretary, and Maaseiah, the officer, under the direction of Hananiah, one of the king's commanders. The whole number of the heads of the father's houses of mighty men of valor was 2,600. So, okay, mighty men of valor, heads, 2,600. Under their command was an army of 307,500 who could make war with mighty power. Now, lots of guys can make war, but these guys could make war with mighty power to help the king against the enemy. And Uzziah prepared for all the army shields, spears, helmets, coats of mail, bows, and stones for slinging. In Jerusalem, now here's the first time this is mentioned, in Jerusalem, which is his capital, he made in then he made engines invented by skillful men to be on the towers and the corners to shoot arrows and great stones. Wow. All right, so here we begin to have mechanized military. Okay. He actually built machines that could shoot multiple arrows and sling great stones. Okay, so we have mechanized military beginning under him. And notice these were invented. Now, some of you just need to be looking around and realizing difficult times are good times to invent something new. And his fame spread far, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong, okay? So his fame and strength, why? God's help. Now, we, we saw that up here earlier. So, verse 8 Verse 7 and 8, we'll go up here and we'll type uh, verse 15. And down here we'll type verse, or we'll write verse 7 and 8. But, uh, now the buts come. When he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. All right, so this is the season. This is the problem. And this is the fruit or the effect. When he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. Do you know how many men I've watched do that in my life? Preachers, businessmen, military men. When they're strong, they grow proud. They forget every bit of strength you've got is because of God's help. Diba? So that he had forgotten Every bit of strength he had was because of God's help. So he's strong. He got a problem. He grew proud. And pride, Proverbs says, comes before fall. So I will put that verse out here. Whoops. Wrong. Push the wrong thing with my palm. Sorry about that. You notice I have the NLT up above this one. So we're going to come across and we're going to say, I need to put a verse in here. And again, if you weren't here with me, I would look it up real quick. Pride cometh before a fall from Proverbs. Now, the manifestation is what comes next. What is the manifestation of his pride? He was unfaithful to the Lord his God, and he entered the temple to burn incense on the altar of incense. All right. His manifestation was he wanted spiritual duties. Now, I've watched businessmen do this. Please forgive me, but I, I've watched businessmen all of a sudden, they, they're successful and they're wealthy, and now all of a sudden they want to preach and they don't want the pastor anymore. Taking spiritual responsibilities, that's not their place. So he's unfaithful to the Lord his God, entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. He wanted to function like a priest, and that's not his place. He's king. But Azariah the priest went in after him with 80 priests of the Lord who were men of valor. They had to be because, you know what? <laughs> when you cross the king, your life is forfeit. And they withstood Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, King Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests and the sons of Aaron who are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have done wrong. It will, bring you, it will bring you no honor from the Lord. So in other words, hey, king, keep your place. 
Now please, you're king. You rule the whole nation. Keep your place. You've done wrong, and it will bring you no honor from the Lord. Now Uzziah was angry. (laughs) See, he's not being used to being told what to do. He's proud, remember? Now he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And when he became angry with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead in the presence of the priest in the house of the Lord by the altar of incense. What's going on? God protected the ministry. See, he's growing angry. He could order all those priests to be killed. But as he's growing angry, God smites him with leprosy. And he leaves the temple. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests look at him. And behold, he was leprous in his forehead. And they rushed him out quickly. And he himself hurried to go out because the Lord had struck him. He realized, man, I just crossed a line. Now, here's the problem. King Uzziah was a leper to the day of his death. And being a leper, lived in a separate house, for he was excluded from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's household, governing the people of the land. Now, you're going to see here in a little while, Jotham was still a child. He was still a child, but he's governing the people of the land because his daddy is leprous until the day of his death. Now, again, I want you to see something here. I want you to understand, here was a man that started well, okay? He started well, seeking God, and he ended up separated from God. And what put this, what was the big change? Pride. That was the big change. The priests were not trying to run the kingdom, but he wanted to take over a priestly function. Hmm. And when his anger burned and he started to reach out to destroy the priests, God struck him. Now the rest of the Acts of Uzziah from first to last, Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, wrote, And Uzziah slept with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in a burial field that belonged to the kings. For they said, He is a leper. And Jotham, his son, reigned in his place. Chapter 27, verse 1. Jotham was 25 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 16 years old. Now, how many years? So, how many years did he govern? Because remember, he had to govern because his daddy had leprosy. His mother's name was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all his father Uzziah had done, except he did not enter the temple of the Lord. Now, before we finish the last sentence, why? Was he... Angry at God? Was he afraid of God? Was he afraid of his own pride? I don't know. I don't know the answer to the question. I can only ask the question. That's how we learn. So he he did what was right in the eyes of God, but he would never enter the temple to worship. But the people still followed corrupt practices. So you see, good leader, good leader, bad people. Now you can have that. He built the upper gate of the house of the Lord and did much building on the wall of Ophel. Moreover, he built cities in the hill country of Judah and forts and towers on the wooded hills. He fought the king of the Ammonites and prevailed against them. And the Ammonites gave him that year a thousand talents of silver, ten thousand cores of wheat, and ten thousand of barley. The Ammonites paid him the same amount in the second and third years. And Jotham became mighty. Notice, became mighty. Because he ordered his ways before the Lord. All right, so the path to mighty 
You order your ways before the Lord. Great thought. Now the rest of the acts of Jotham and all his wars and his ways are they written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. He was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And Jotham slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. And Ahaz's son reigned in his place. So this was a young guy. So we'll say he died young. Chapter 28, verse 1. Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord as his father David had done. So now we have a bad king. But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. All right, so he made a, a choice of, not a choice of following, but a choice of whose example? I'm not going to follow the example of my fathers and my ancestors. I'm going to follow the example of these rebellious people. He chose his lifestyle. He even made metal images for the Baal. Now, this would have been expensive for the Baals. These are demon gods. And he made offerings in the valley of the son of Hinnon and burned his sons as an offering. Human sacrifice. According to the abomination of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. Now, how do you burn your son alive? How do you, I mean, how do you burn your child alive as a sacrifice to a demon god? As a parent, you'd cut your arm off to save your child. You'd give your life to save your child. What kind of a heart? Now, one of the things you're going to have to learn, well, people who are into idolatry and demon worship, they don't have a soft, tender heart like you and I do. Hanging out with God gives you a soft and tender heart. People who do demon worship, they have hard hearts. He sacrificed and made offerings on the high places, on the hills, and under every green tree. Therefore, the Lord gave him into the hand of the king of Assyria, who defeated him and took captive a great number of his people and brought them to Damascus. He was also given into the hand of the king of Israel, who struck him with great force. So he had two defeats. He had the defeat of Syria, and he had the defeat of the ten tribes. Now, he's imitating their lifestyle, and they destroy him. Wow. You just, you need to think about that. Those he imitated destroyed him. For Pekah, the son of Remaliah, killed 120,000 from Judah in one day all of them men of valor, because they had forsaken the Lord, the God of their fathers. Zikri, a mighty man of Ephraim, killed Maasiah, the king's son, and Azrikam, the commander of palace, and Elkanah, the next in authority of the king. The men of Israel took captive 200,000 of their relatives, women, sons, and daughters, they also took much spoil and brought the spoil to Samaria. But a prophet of the Lord was there. <laughs> a man of God was there, whose name was Oded. And he went out to meet the army. Now, okay, so you got one man, one prophet versus victorious army. Fascinating. And said to them, Behold, because the Lord, the God of your fathers, was angry with Judah, he gave them to your hand, but you have killed them in a rage that has reached up to heaven. So people can take things. They took it too far. And now you intend to subjugate the people of Judah and Jerusalem, male and female, as your slaves? Have you not sins of your own against the Lord? Now hear me, and send back the captives from your relatives whom you have taken, for the fierce wrath of the Lord is upon you. Wow. Certain chiefs, also of the men of Ephraim, Azariah, the son of Jehanan, Bekah Bekahiah, 
the son of Milashamoth, Jezekiah, the son of Shalom, and Amasa, the son of Hadlai, stood up against those who were coming from war. Okay, here are men who took a stand against an army. Not just any army, a victorious army. And said to them, you shall not bring the captives in here, for you propose to bring upon us guilt against the Lord in addition to our present sins and guilt. For our guilt is already great, and there is fierce wrath against Israel. So the armed men left the captives and the spoil before the princes and all the assembly. And the men who had been mentioned by name rose and took the captives, and with the spoil they clothed all who were naked. They clothed them, they gave them sandals, provided them with food and drink, anointed them, and carrying all the female among them on donkeys, they brought them to their kinsfolk at Jericho, the city of Palms. Then they returned to Samaria. Now remember, if Jerusalem was up here on the top of the mountain, Jericho is down here at the bottom. So all they have to do now is get back up the mountain. At that time, King Ahaz sent to the king of Assyria for help. For the Edomites had invaded and defeated Judah and carried away captives. And the Philistines made raids on the cities that are in Shephelah and the Negev of Judah and had taken Beth Shemesh, Ajalon, Gedaroth, Sokah and its villages, Timnah and its villages, Gimzo and its villages, and they settled there. For the Lord humbled Judah because of Ahaz, king of Israel, For he had made Judah act sinfully and had been very unfaithful to the Lord. So a leader leaders fruit. Leaders lead and they can lead people to God or they can lead people to sin. He had made Judah act sinfully. Sometimes I sit down with young pastors and say, you have to understand your teaching can either lead people to sin or your teaching can lead people to God. So tiglath (laughs) Pileser, I'm sorry, I always laugh at that because when we were thinking about naming Shasha, we were laughing with it. I said, let's name her tiglath Pileser and call her Tiggy for short. So tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, came against him and afflicted him instead of strengthening him. Okay, this, this guy's supposed to help. So wait a minute, supposed to help. Now, brothers and sisters, in a time of weakness, you have to be careful because people that you thought were supposed to strengthen you actually afflict you. Be careful. When sharks begin to circle, be careful. For Ahaz took a portion from the house of the Lord and the house of the king and the princes and gave tribute to the king of Assyria, but it did not help him. In the time of his distress, he became yet more faithless to the Lord the same, the same King Ahaz. Now, trouble will either make you seek God or make you turn away, turn farther away. It's your choice. For he sacrificed to the gods of Damascus that had defeated him and said, Because the gods of the kings of Syria helped them, I will sacrifice to them that they may help me. But they were the ruin of him and of all of, of Israel. So notice, because the gods of the kings of Syria helped them, I'll sacrifice. Right, so that's what you call a copy life. It worked for them, so it should work for me. It doesn't work like that. Never do things just because it looks like it worked for somebody else. And it has gathered together the vessels of the house of God and cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God. And he shut up the doors of the house of God and he made himself altars in every corner of Jerusalem. All right, so here the king shuts the temple. He just got a bad attitude toward God and shut down the temple. Wow. I was thinking about that the other day going, you know, are are there some... Government leaders and nations of the world that hate God so much, they're using this as a great opportunity to shut the doors of the house of God. Wow. In every city of Judah, he made high places to make offerings to other gods, provoking the Lord to anger the God of his fathers. Now the rest of his acts and all his ways from first to last. Behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And they had slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city in Jerusalem. For they did not bring him to the tombs of the king of Israel. (laughs) 
and you ask the question, why? Because he's a bad king. And Hezekiah, his son, reigned in his place. We'll see you tonight, 7 o'clock, as we begin Romans chapter 1.